Radio Fair. Thanks so much for joining us. I am so excited to have Violet here. I met her at a Thrive Festival, which was in Kabulho, which was amazing. There was this, it was an abundance of healers, honestly, in their own way, shape, and form. I met Miss Violet. And she, she just blew me away with her talk because it related so closely to what I believe about how any person, regardless of whether you're a child or an adult, you need to be calm and collected inside before you can deal with the rest of the world and how you can expand your range of where you can stay calm. So I don't even know where to start. She's a Feldenkrais practitioner. She's a Tellington Touch equine practitioner and a somatic practitioner. Anyway, she's all about keeping your body calm. <laughs> so I'll let her take it away and tell you more about what exactly that entails. Yeah, so hi, I'm Violet. Um, and I'm thrilled to bits to be here. This is really fun. And um, I'm all about helping your, you to be able to manage life and have fun in the world in a, in a way. So it's not necessarily being calm, but it's being able to ride the waves and when things get too exciting or overwhelming, can you find your way back to the place where things are fun, where things feel safe, where things feel good, where you feel like you can manage things, right? Um, and that is a skill, that, that whole idea of it's called regulating your, your um, nervous system so that you can come into the, the range of experiences that feel safe and therefore they're fun, they're interesting, they're engaging, and you, and you sort of like doing them as compared to the ones that feel, uh, that are the danger responses to the world. And in our biology, we have, our biology is, you know, has millions of years of experience getting ready to be here in the world right now and being able to um, help you stay alive and keep going. And those biological responses to danger will kick in and take over any nice little ideas from the brain if the sense of danger is too much, right? And this is a biological response to the world. It's not a behavioral response to the world. It's where your biology is basically, you know, Dr. Stephen Porges just talks about hijacks your best ideas and just takes care of things so that you stay alive and keep going. And um, when you're in the danger side of things, um, it's not so easy and it's not so good. And it's where kids get in trouble because they're, you know, they're acting out or they're doing stuff. But if we sort of look at that as understanding as a response to danger rather than a behavior choice, then it becomes really different. And then the interesting question becomes, how can we help people come back into ourselves and our kids or whoever come back into the place where, um, I have more choice and where the things feel safe so that thinking actually happens. And you know, my best ideas can start to influence what I'm doing more and where stuff like that makes sense. So that's what today's about. Awesome. And when you, when you say the danger zone in this zone, it really brings me back to what I would call the zones of regulation. Yes. You have the, the like blue zone. I'm tired. I'm sad. I'm lethargic. The, the yellow zone, the kids would be like, is really high excitement or really high anxiety. I just yeah. have this feeling in my body. The green zone is like, I'm happy, I'm glad, I can handle this, I feel safe. And then you get into the red zone, which is like, I'm angry, I'm scared, I'm almost out of control. Yeah, and I've actually you know, built the zones into the presentation for today so that you can see where they are. Because the green zone is the, the area where things, where all is well and where I can deal with the world. And the other three are over in the danger zones. The red, the yellow, and the blue are all over the danger responses. And it's where those responses are not behavioral choices. They're our biology taking care of us and making sure we stay alive while it feels danger. So if we understand it that way, then it's completely different than, oh, this, I'm being, you know, this kid's being bad or I'm out of control or whatever, you know, like those kinds of things. And it's understanding uh, what our biology has to do with this. And then how can we open up more room to, and find our way back to the, the place where things feel safe and where uh, we can manage the world well? Awesome. So, so I really appreciate you changing your slides up and gearing it a little towards this amazing audience. And, and let's see what, uh, what you have. Yeah, let me just uh, slideshow, slideshow, play from start. Here we go, should take the whole, is it taking up the whole screen there? It sure is. Perfect, okay. 
So this is all about, as I said, the biology of what's called fight, flight, and freeze, which are our danger responses in the world, in our biology. The importance of feeling safe, which is that um, place in our biology where we do feel safe and we can manage the world better, and how to cultivate that feeling safe place. Buttons. Um, so just so everyone knows, at the end of the slideshow, I've got resources. So I've got like three pages of names of people and cool stuff to look at if you want. I've also got a bit more information about me and my background if you want to see that. And I'll just make sure those show up at the end so you can stop the video and look at them if you want to look at those. But I won't take a lot of time now to talk about those. Awesome. Um, so our body, our nervous system runs the show, basically. Um, and we've got part of our nervous system that we control, like if I'm going to reach for a glass of water or, um, you know, brush my hair or do something like that, that's um, a voluntary nervous system thing. But there's also the nervous system that takes care of everything running in the background, and that's called the autonomic nervous system. So that takes care of things like digestion and pumping of the blood and the blood pressure and, you know, breathing and all those things. And we can have some influence over those, but we don't have to think about them. They will run even if we're not thinking about them. And there's two big divisions, um, two big sectors in that autonomic nervous system. And one of them is the sympathetic nervous system, which its job is to speed things up and get you ready for action. And it includes, but is not just, the fight-flight response system. It's also getting excited for doing whatever you want to do. Play soccer, uh, run for the bus, whatever it is you want to do. It sort of activates. And then there's the parasympathetic nervous system, which calms and slows things down. And it's um, included, one of its jobs is the uh, freeze response to danger. And it also helps us be able to just calm down and do healthy kinds of calm things like sleep, rest, recover, re rebuild our body after you know a hard workout, those kinds of things. So we're gonna look a little bit more at both of those. And for a long time, there was a, a sense that there was just uh, the up and the down, right? Like that basically either you were in your sympathetic nervous system and you're aroused or you came down and you were in the resting place. But it turns out that in mammals, it's more complicated than that. And mammals are, you know, lots of the animals we know, dogs, cats, deer, cows, horses, people, um, any animals that raise their young and have to take care of them for a while and feed milk to their babies. So that's the mammals. And in mammals, um, it's been found that instead of just one um, parasympathetic nervous system branch, there's actually two. There's two pathways. And they're very different, and it really helps to understand what's going on in a person if you know about these two different pathways and what they look like and what they mean for us. So those two pathways are kind of like um, the two places you can land, or sort of like if you're on a bridge, and if you sort of imagine the top of the bridge being, you know, once you've been excited and mobilized and in action, um, and then you come down the bridge. This is a bridge down in a park in... Um, San Francisco. It's a cool bridge. Anyways, and on one side, if you come down, you land in the land where all is well. It's sort of like, this is the place where when you're calm, um, you feel like you could eat, you could sleep, you can play, things feel good. It's all good there. But there's also the other side. And if you come down the other side and you slow down there, it's a completely different world, a completely different experience. They're both slower. They both might look calm but they're very different. So I want to sort of take you into each of them so you get a sense of them. How are we doing so far? Looks good to me. Alrighty, so let's go into all as well first. So hopefully, and if people can't see this, they can sort of click, you know, get rid of the pictures of you and me there. <laughs> I love that you incorporated little Miss Joy. There she is. I sent you, that is yes. Charlie. Yeah, so this is the green zone. Okay, this is the place where things are good, right? And you can have action and mobilization to do the things you like. And it's kind of action that's, that lets you do stuff well. So you can get, for, you know, I get excited to come and do this talk with you, you know, and I get excited when I go out on my paddleboard and I get to be on the ocean, those kinds of things. They need mobilization, they need action. So that's sympathetic nervous system, gets me ready to do stuff. 
And then the parasympathetic lets me come down um, into a place that feels safe in the body. And it's run by the ventral vagus nerve. So there's two branches of the vagus nerve. And this one sits, runs mostly in your chest, and it works with the facial uh, nerves as well. And so a lot of the time we can see and we read what's going on with the ventral vagus nerve by how people are expressing in their faces, in their body language. And um, this is where social cues become really important. If, this, if a person can land here, they can show different kinds of engagement and interest in their face and stuff. And this place helps support health and rest and recovery and play and emotional regulation that's all good, right? It sort of lets you function well. And on the all is well side, you can have both arousal and calming. And it can be within this range here. This is healthy regulated range. And this woman, Irene Lyon, if you want more online stuff, she's got great online stuff about emotional regulation and about, um, about, this, about this biology of fight, flight, and freeze and what to work with. So just so people know, she's a great resource. But there is a range that we have. You know, there's sort of a range in which I can get excited and I can calm down. And in all of that range, it's called a window of tolerance. Um, I feel safe and it feels good. So I can play fight there. And I can, um, I can wrestle, I can do something that's interesting. I can also be immobilized. I can be still and feel safe. Um, and that's really important because for kids, um, if it doesn't feel safe to be still, then it's a real problem. If they can find a way to be still and, be, and feel safe, then their world is more manageable. And with horses, this is, you know, it's, I work a lot with animals. And so we see this stuff in animals a lot. And sometimes it's easier to imagine it in animals and how it works there because we have less sort of judgment when we're watching animals than we watch if, when we're watching ourselves or our kids or those kinds of things. So, you know, when horses play fight, they have a range in which it's all fun and games. It's all good. They, you know, bite each other's neck and they sort of jump around and chase each other around. And that's different than when they get in a real fight. And it's in part how they socialize with, with each other. They, they do their stuff there. And it's, and it's good and it's healthy. And then every once in a while, we might get something that really scares us and we need to do something, right? And if things get scary or overwhelming, they no longer feel safe. Now you have a sense of danger in your body. And it's your body that's deciding that the sense of danger is in there. It doesn't matter what the brain thinks. The body will feel it. And you can check in your gut. You can check in the nerve complex here. Your gut has a huge nerve complex in it that tells you a lot about what's in the world and whether it's safe or not. So you can check in with these places within yourself that pick up sensory information and send it up to the brain. And sort of the brain then goes, ooh, you know, and it starts to figure out, does this feel good or does it feel dangerous? And if it feels dangerous, then the body will kick into a biological response to take care of that danger. And it's called either fight or fight flight um, you know, or there's fight flight's an example of when you go into arousal, that's taking care of it. And freeze is if you go into um, a shutdown to take care of stuff, right? Like either completely going still, you might faint. There's a number of different freeze things. We'll look at those. And it's great to have fight flight and freeze for moments when you need them. You know, like if something scares me uh, right here and I need to get out of the way, I'll get out of the way. And it's really good to have that response to be able to move quickly, get it done, and then ideally come back into the range that feels safe and healthy, right? Because that's, a, it's a higher cost of doing business. Once I go into a danger response, the body has to work differently and it takes more out of me to be working in fighter in one of those, those danger responses. And I think it really reminds me of some of my kids because as soon as their anxiety gets up, they start vibrating, they start running around. Yes. It's, it's, it's not them being like unruly. It's just their body is saying, I can't sit still. I gotta and do something. If anxiety goes up, they yep. get faster and vibrating faster. Yeah. And then they gotta do something, right? And the biologist says, do something. And so kids will, do, uh, there's, um, you know, there's the fight, flight. There's also fidgeting and fooling around, which is sort of a, a strategy for doing something in a socially acceptable way. Animals do this too. So if you watch dogs that are coming to meet each other and one dog's a little stressed about the other one, the dog that's a little stressed will suddenly turn around and start sniffing the ground over there and looking at those dogs over there and kind of noticing other stuff, right? He's trying to calm the situation 
do something so he can move around a little bit and kind of assess how things are going before he decides, do I need full on fight flight or can I come back into a safe zone, right? right. But it's sort of like a doing something. It's just like me, if I get worried, you know, you see people and it's like they're in a meeting or they're in something where they're worried and they're sitting there like this. Like, I'm totally fine. Yeah. Right? No. So there's something where your body needs to do something. And it's good if those responses happen to deal with a specific moment and then um, when the threat's over or you feel the threat is over and you can come back in the safe zone. The problem comes if they get stuck there. And a lot of people get stuck either in uh, sort of arousal, being really over vigilant, or shut down. And we'll look at what those look like. But it's just knowing that, you know, if you're here for a short time, it's great. If you're here for a long time, it takes a big toll on you because physiologically, it's a higher cost of doing business in our bodies. Um, it takes a bigger, we can't recover as well, and um, it's not, it's, it's harder on us. So if you come down the other side, instead of it landing at all as well land, you come into uh, freeze or shut down. Um, so this time you're gonna have, when you're responding to danger, the kind of arousal you get is what we've just been talking about. It's sort of something where you have to deal with the danger. You have to move, you have to do something. And you're in a danger response and thinking is not, you know, thinking about, you know, what I was supposed to do for my lesson plan or something isn't the main thing. It's how do I deal with this situation right here? Right? That kind of thing. And the freeze is an area we don't know much about it. A lot of people don't know much about it because it's kind of invisible sometimes because this is where in the horse world, for example, trail riding horses who have to have, you know, six different riders a day on them and they just have to sort of shut down and sort of plod along. It's like going through the motions for it. Um, it's like instead of feeling too much, it's best just to shut down the feelings. You get numb. You can sort of numb or shut down the feelings. You can even collapse. It's a sense of collapse in the body sometimes, sometimes not. You can have people who look like they're functioning well, but basically not too much is coming in or going out, right? It's like the, the lights are on, but nobody's really home. Um, and it's an interesting state because it's um, your gut, the gut feeling. If you ask people what's going on, the gut may just have this gut feeling of there's some danger. Things feel dangerous. I don't feel safe, but I can't tell you why, right? But you can ask them, do you feel safe? And they'll go, if I feel my body, no. Um, but I may not know why. Right. And they may not be able to hear well either. And it's the same with fight or flight. On the danger response side of things, our, physio, our hearing changes because the muscles in the, in, in the middle ear change. And when the muscles in the middle ear are not working properly, we can't distinguish between uh, middle range sounds and really, we can't um, separate out, you know, somebody's voice from background noise as well. We can't hear the middle range as well. We hear lower sounds more. Okay. Those kinds of things. So, you know, a, a kid or a person who is in a danger response and it looks like they're not listening, they might not be able to hear well, re real well or be able to separate out your voice from other voices, from other sounds. It's, a, it's an actual not being able to hear well. Um, and the thing with this one, it may look calm. You might have a kid who's compliant and sort of being there, but their, their body is swimming in stress chemistry on the inside and you've got this whole other thing going on that's not engagement on the all as well side. It's not the same as. And, and you, you, those will be my, the kids I work with who are all good for everyone thinks they're all good at school and they're so well behaved for everyone else. But when they get safe in their home, they cause chaos because it's a safe place for them to let yeah. that yeah. out. Yeah. And often the way the, the, uh, the way out of freeze. So, so the, in, in our development as mammals, you know, over the millions of years, um, Freeze was the, the earliest sort of danger response. Reptiles have freeze, uh, birds have freeze. Deer? Uh, lots of animals have freeze, right? And they sort of like, they just, they're, if danger shows up, they stop. Bunnies do it, right? Because bunnies are mammals. But anyways, you know, and then fight or flight is something for those who, uh, the animals that can move, that's sort of another one. But if fight or flight doesn't work, then you end up going to freeze. It's sort of like the most primitive, the most right. basic, the most 
um, if I'm really, really, really in trouble, I'll go into freeze. Or if I've learned in a situation that that's what's my best option, right? Then that's what I'll go to as my go-to thing. You know, if this is how I stay out of trouble and life works better, I'll go there. Yeah. And so these biological responses really are physiological responses to danger. They're not behavior choices. Right. So freeze will kick in as a last resort, you know, after fight or flight doesn't work. For example, you can't escape or you've learned compliance or helplessness. You've learned that this is the best way to be. Um, freeze can happen first, for example, in a startle, when my horse startles at something, right? So like this, freeze, yeah. take a look at it, decide whether I have to run or whether it's okay, right? Um, or if I want to be invisible or if I've learned this is the best way, it's just easier in the world if I don't respond to things. Yep. Anxiety can be a situation, especially anxiety where the person's really anxious and they can't do anything. Then yep. you've got fight, flight, and freeze both happening at the same time. It's like having your foot on the gas and on the brakes both at the same time, and you're completely unable to do anything. <laughs> yeah. Right? So it's, sort of, but it's, it's over there in the danger response stuff. It, it, it's, in some ways, it makes me think of some of the kids who have learned at school the best way to get out of something is to lay down on the ground to flop. Yeah. A little bit nervous, yeah. a little bit scared, but part of that is also a learned behavior, knowing that, that at least in Canada, in most of the public schools, they have a no-touch policy. So this gets uh. out of what I don't want to do, because no one, unless cat happens to be there, or it's a cat session, can actually pick me up and make me do this. Yeah. And so it's, it's, a, it's a coping skill, right? It's a coping choice. It's something they've chosen. That's their best way to deal with the situation. So these kinds of patterns, if, if, um, if we kind of look at our body and go, okay, the things that we're doing, especially the stuff, we don't wake up in the morning going, geez, I really, I'm going to do everything I can to piss off the world and get in a lot of trouble today. Yes. That's what will make me feel happy. That's not how, how kids wake up. It's not how animals wake up. It's not how... It's how, not like a Disney movie with an evil... An evil, no, like, no, right? So it so wakes like, up like, what kind of chaos yeah. can I cause yeah. today? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what kind of trouble can I cause exactly? <laughs> you know? But it's sort of like uh, they get in a situation and they get overwhelmed or something happens. And so they go for a coping skill or something that is the best option they can come up with at the time. Yeah. And it's sort of like trying to do the best they can with with what they know and it's in their physiology it's not a, it's not a behavior thing it's how do i stay alive right mm -hmm. and so what they can look like fight flight can look at look be interesting we know this one more we mm -hmm. might think of bucking broncos and so on when you have a kid exploding or a person you know adult exploding yeah. me exploding um you know the blood goes into the arms and legs you get re getting ready for action you might be i might be over exuberant or over stimulated um, when it's chronic, when fight flight becomes that place where you sort of plateau and stay there, it might show up as sort of a sense of constant vigilance, of, of constantly kind of wondering what's around me and being concerned. Yeah. Um, yeah. Perhaps hypersensitive, hyperactive, all those things. They're sort of like just trying to keep track of what's around me because I don't know and it feels scary. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, freeze can be very interesting because there's a whole range of freeze stuff. From a little bit of freeze to, you know, fairly just going through the motions kind of thing, yeah. um, but not engaged. And the, this is one where the, the body is lowering most of the biological um, life things like blood, um, blood flow, um, heart rate, um, the breathing. Uh, you might be here because your adrenals are completely exhausted and your body doesn't know what else to do. So it collapses, physiological collapse. Um, and it can look calm, as I said, but it can, it's actually really, um, bathed in stress chemistry. And this dog here, for example, you might have a, if you imagine your pets being depressed or whatever, it's sort of like, um, I'm, some forms of depression exhibit all these things. Mm -hmm. right? Sort of a sense of the world is too much. I just have to shut it out and I can only run on this much energy and that's all I've got. So I'm just going to get through the day as best I can. Um, both of these states, both of these biological states of responding to danger are a high cost of doing business. When you're in these states, your body does not get to re rejuvenate and recover. The cells don't recover well. You don't have the oxygen coming in in that time of real rest 
to come in and actually be able to recover from things. And learning is not the top priority. Survival is the top priority. So at that point, you know, somebody may be going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, about learning. And three minutes later, it's got gone. It. I got it. I got it. Mm, yeah. you got it. Yeah. yeah, because it just doesn't settle in. It doesn't actually deal with the top priority in their physiology, which is, is this going to help me stay alive? Right. right? And that's got to be dealt with first. So that feeling of that feeling safe has to happen first. That has to, that found, it's a foundation. And then the other stuff can happen on top of that. Learning, um, being socially engaged, you know, figuring out better behavior strategies, all those things can happen once the feeling safe part is in place. And it's an interesting thing, like when you look at digestion, because lots of the kids I work with, because they're at this higher end of, of fight or flight, they, yeah. their digestive system just doesn't work. They're not hungry. Their food is still sitting in their belly because it hasn't digested since lunchtime because their body is thinking, I gotta go. Yeah. I don't need to digest this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and irritable bowel syndrome, a lot of those things can happen just because food isn't moving properly through right. and the body doesn't know what to do with the food. It's just not a priority, right? Yeah. But yeah when you're in, in either of these states, um, in fight or flight, you know, in, in the arousal state, um, yeah, the, the blood's going out to the, the muscles. The, you know, you're ready for action rather, rather than ready for digesting. Right. And so to come into the place where digesting becomes possible and so on, you have to find the way back into that, that sort of safer feeling zone and then into the calmer spots in that safer feeling zone so that um, the body has time to rest and do that stuff, that good stuff, self-maintenance. Yeah. And I think a really key thing that helps, the thing that really turned around my way of looking at stuff and that people I work with love is sort of looking at our bodies as our bodies are smart. Yeah. The things that are going on are going on, including behavior patterns, because it was the best idea we could come up with at the time it first started to deal with the situation. And it worked because I'm here and I'm alive, right? right? So your body found something that got you through life and got you here. This is amazing. And Dr. Stephen Porges, who developed the, the polyvagal theory, um, you know, the, the stuff about the vagus nerve and the two parts there, when he really started to look at that, he says, you know, we need to realize how amazing our bodies are, especially when we've been going through a lot of time spent in the danger zones, how incredibly resourceful my body, your body has been to be able to survive and do that and be here now. It's like you've, you, you're a hero, like you've done amazing yeah. things to be able to get through this and it was useful when it once started and it, can we find something that feels a little easier now right like that was really useful then let's look at what, where you are now is it possible to find something that feels even better and helps you feel safe here now in a different way that becomes the interesting thing right but it's kind of like really acknowledging and being amazed at how remarkable our whole cells, our smart cells are, and that we are smart and then we learn and figure out things that work for us. But here's your pictures. Nice, I love them. So in the Tellington Touch work that I do, I work with animals and we've sort of got this simple, wonderfully simple model. Of, you know, if, if concern shows up, if you're noticing concern in the animal or the person that you're working with that's getting in the way of learning or interacting or being here, you can, there's sort of five types of concern you can look for. And I'll just jump to the next slide and I'll come back to this one. Sure. The magic is, if one of these five Fs is present, change something to reduce the level of concern. Right. That's it, right? Yes. And we'll look at what kinds of things you can change in a minute, but I'll go back to this. But it's a this beautiful little model. It's like if these are around, it just means that they're getting in the way. Yes. And so what you want to see is can you change that so the person can feel safe and then thinking can start. And this works with, you know, I work with horses a lot. And if you've got a horse who's really, like, concerned and doesn't want to be there and so on, there's no way they're going to learn something until they're feeling safe enough. So they might be doing any one of these behaviors as well. So the five behaviors are fight which is, you know, do something, address the situation, try to, try to deal with it, or flight, get out of it. Right. And fool around or fidget. These are all sympathetic nervous system parts, right? Because they're all taking action. Yeah. So this is, uh, you know, not so much um, but being silly, being wiggly, uh, being excited, 
in a way that's just sort of frantic, those kinds of things. Those are all things where you're trying to take action in a smaller way than full on flight flight. Right. It's, it's coming. It's coming. I'm nervous. I can't. Yeah. And maybe, and maybe, I, yet. Yeah, and maybe this will help me, you know, like that working with, with, um, Putty. and things like that and putty can help sometimes be enough to take care of it and then come back into the place that feels safer but so you have to look at does that actually help or are they just learning to bottle it up one or the other right but it, it is something and it's also these are great cues if you can notice fidget fool around things yes. it is sort of the cue that i'm starting up can we catch this now and come back down again rather than waving like i'm here i'm here nobody's noticing and going up to here and I, and I have a couple of kids who like, they'll have a fidget or something, but if they've been fidgeting for a while, the teacher will touch them on the, or their aide will touch them on the shoulder and they'll go jump on a trampoline. Yeah. Like, up, back down and into class. Perfect. Like, a tiny little yeah. trampoline in there, in there. And it's super cool because all the kids have just known that that's what that child does when he can't sit still. Yeah. And he does a couple jumps and then he comes back and joins the class. Yeah. And movement, movement is so helpful because help, movement really helps them let stuff move through. Yeah, and and uh, sitting sitting is the hardest thing. Like being calm yes. is very is very difficult, right? So if they're able to move, it can move it through, and then often that's a much better thing. Um, you know, horses horses are like this too. Any animal is like this. If they get to move yes. around a little bit, show you they're concerned, and then you respond. If I'm with a kid or with a horse, and they start to show the signs of being concerned, and I can respond, then that already feels safer it's like you noticed me okay yes. you know the teacher taught the kids touches this kid on the back he gets to go on the trampoline for a couple minutes great you know you've had sort of i've, I've been seen i've been heard yeah. i'm valued she's yeah. saying yes, it's okay to go jump on my trampoline yeah yes. and that's my way of dealing with it right so then the other two f's that, are, that we have in telling to touch they're both part of the parasympathetic one is freeze which we've talked about an extreme form of freeze which would be fainting Right, where it's just complete overwhelm. Right. I can't do anything. I will just pass out. Right. And that does happen sometimes when people are beyond what they're able to, to manage, what they're what, beyond what they can cope with. And as I said, the great thing, the simple model is if you notice the concern and it's getting in the way, just change something to see if you can reduce that level of concern. And so let's look at some of the things that we can play with that, that are sort of handy tools to get started with. These, these, these are little tools, but they can be useful. And this can help you find the green zone back. And your way to the green zone. It's like the little breadcrumbs to the green zone. Lots of animal examples here. One of them is if there's something that you're asking this kid to do or that you're being asked to do that's too big, that's too much, chunk it down into littler pieces. Make successful little steps. So the example here is, you know, this is the first time this horse is being ridden. This was after many lots of little steps. And our goal is to make, you know, the first time on the horse about as exciting as watching paint dry. Because then it's just the next step. It's no big, no big deal. It's all good. No rodeo. You know, so it's being able to chunk it down enough for this person to feel they can be successful and that they can do it. And in, the, ther in, in, in the therapy world, they would use forward chaining or backward chaining or breaking and which is basically just breaking it into smaller manageable pieces i will do this part if you do just this tiny piece yeah and just making sure that little piece is something the kid can do and, and yes. feel safe about doing right again it's got to feel safe yeah for sure. want, are safe enough to try it out so it's one of those things of you get to try it out and then you get to check am i okay after i did it you know right. so yeah. And with horses, if, if they don't like trailer, if they're scared to go on a trailer, we'll start them walking across a piece of plywood. Right. And this time across the plywood might be a little bit like this, but then we stop and we have them look at it, you know, and then they kind of go, you know, and after a few times over yeah. the plywood, it's lost the charge. So then they can move on to the next piece. It's finding things like that, right? Like little pieces that make sense to them. And you can just build little things that make sense. And doing a little bit at a time and leaving it. For sure, okay. leaving them, letting them be successful and coming back to it another time. Exactly. Stop while you're ahead. <laughs> yes. Freedom to move. You talked about this, right? Being able to move a bit. Movement helps stuff move through us. We're physiologically built for that. It also lets us feel we can move in or out of a situation a little bit. Right. Um, we can change positions. 
Um, I'm not trapped. I have some choice. I have I can do something to make myself feel safer. And you know, this thing that we're doing here with the dog, this is just a sliding rope. We've gotten into this thing that we call the beeline, which is just a sliding rope and letting animals walk on a sliding rope, which you'd think would, they'd be all over the place. But right. most animals within a very short time, even the ones that are completely all over the place, great big horses that are like, like this, within five minutes, 10 minutes, they're kind of like walking and it's like totally different. Right. You know, and it's like they have some choice, they get to change, they get to, they have freedom to, to choose how to be engaged in this. Well, and I, want, I wonder if a little bit of it is that they know they have the control. So if something yes. comes up in the path before them, they know they can move to the right or move to the left. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And knowing that they can, they can take care of themselves. You know, they have, they have some freedom to move to take care of themselves if they need to. And then this one's really interesting. Asking in your body, does this feel safe? Right? And this is really different than asking, like if I ask you, you know, um, do, do, just put your hands behind your head, you know, like this. And then you do that. And then I say, does this feel safe? And then you can put your hands down again. Right? And for some, uh, you might say, your brain might be going, well, of course this is safe. You know, like it's, I'm in the, it's fine, it's all good. But there might be in your biology something saying that, oh, this is okay, or no, it's not, right? And so you get to check in your body, you get to check, I, I sort of say three places, in your gut, in here, because there's neural complexes in both these places that feed information up, right. in the back of the old brain, which is in the back of your neck and the brain stem, and then in the thinking brain up here, right? Check in those places, does this feel safe? And if all of those places say yes, then it's sort of like, okay, it's going to be easy. This will integrate well. We can step forward. If any one of those places is saying no, especially in your body, your body's going to be kind of like this. But I way to do it. No, you're right. Because I've had, I've had many kids that I work like to relate it back to the kids I work with. They're like, I know it should be safe. I feel like my brain is telling me it's safe. I should be able to do this. Why can't my body do this? Why yes. can't I get on that bike? Why can't I? I just can't do it, Kat. Yeah. Yeah. And helping them ask the question so they can actually ask and go, oh, what an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and often how many times them, have we been asked in our life? Have we ever been asked, does this feel safe? Because lots of times I'll ask, well, where does it, what does it feel like? Where yeah. in your body do you feel this? Like you just know it won't move. Is it frozen? You just can't yeah. move if you want to? Or do you have this funny feeling in your tummy? Or is it in your legs? Like just, even having the discussion about where yes. it's showing up in their body can yeah. help us move forward. And actually, if, you, if, you, if they feel something, if they're feeling a sense and, it, and it, instead of being overwhelmed by the event, if they're noticing a sensation, you can say, well, describe your sensation. Tell me more about it, right? Is it round? Is it square? How big is it? Or is it big or this big? Is, does it have a color? Any of those things. So you can start to notice, oh, it's a sensation inside me. Mm -hmm. And then you can start to talk with it. Or you can start to notice, okay, it's not an overwhelming thing. It's something that my body is going. And you can ask, is there anywhere else in your body that actually feels a little better? Right. Right? Because then you can notice I can have two sensations in myself. Yeah. Not the whole thing. It's sort of like, this is my body talking to me. And you can say, this is your body talking to you. So you can have a chat. Right? You can go, hi, thank you for telling me. You know? Again, that whole thing of thanks for talking, thanks for helping me know that something's of concern, you know, whatever you want to say, let's sort of be sure. Yeah. It's okay to have these feelings. It's okay to have that funny yeah. feeling in your belly. That, yeah. that funny feeling in your belly is telling you something. Let's figure it out what it is. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, that feeling in your belly, its job is to tell you when something's of concern and then we can check it out. Yeah. Right? And so if it doesn't feel safe, it's a great question. It's like, no, not really. Okay, well, let's... Let's find out what could feel safe because that will help you feel ready to go on to the next step or whatever. No, for sure. How can I make it feel safe for you? What can yeah, I? It might not be how do I help it make, how do I make it feel safe? But it's like, what can we do to help you find right. your way you know, to make this feel more safe for you? Right. How can we do this together? How can we work on this together? Yeah. And it, that really highlights the relationship that I need and that parents need to yes. have with their child. Yes, we're coming to that. Too. But all of this is relationship stuff. And all of this, um, one of the key things, I'll just go back for a minute. Is it okay if I go back? Yep, for sure.
Um, we were just talking about relating. What was I? I can't remember. About the relationship? Heavens to Betsy, I can't remember. Okay, I'll think of it later. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, yeah, and the power of a pause, of letting there be some space. There's a couple of reasons for this. That you need time to check to go inside. Is this okay? Does this feel safe? Is this okay? You need some time to go check in those places. Your body will take a minute or two to come back with the answer. Right? You also need time once, if the body does sense that something's safe, it takes a little bit to integrate something you just learned, for it to sink in and for yourself, your whole self to take it on. But to take it on is something you can do now. You know, if standing on one foot was really hard and you're learning about standing on one foot, you get to stand on one foot and then you get to go check, was that okay? Right. And is this something that I can imagine myself doing? And then yeah. it becomes something, I just stood on one foot. You know, and then it starts to integrate into your sense of yourself. Yeah, let's just do one swing. Yeah. And see, how was that? Yeah. Bigger or smaller next time? Yeah. Or another one. And leaving enough time in there for a pause. Yeah. Yeah. And then also, especially for big, you know, humans are pretty big. Horses are even yeah. bigger. You need some time for the information. If I'm asking you to do something and it's new, and I'm saying, come with me, right? And it goes from my head, to my arm, to your, you see it, it goes up to your brain, you think about it, it comes back down and your legs take, you know, take a step. But that might take a couple of seconds, unless I'm so vigilant that I'm just trying to be right on top of this because otherwise, otherwise I'm gonna get in trouble, right? Oh, and the one thing that I've learned is that when I ask a child something, I need to bite my tongue, sit on my hands, and give them a good 30 seconds sometimes to process those words I just used. Because Perfect. I think the same way you and I do. Well, I, I don't know how you think. I know how I think. I don't think in pictures. The kids I work with think in pictures. So they have to take each one of those words, turn it into a picture, and then make sense of all those pictures strung together in the way you said them. And yeah. now, now they have to tell their body, oh, that's what that means. That means I have to tell my body to move. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So this whole thing, I would take some time for the body, to, you know, information to get to the brain, the brain decide what to do and the body to be ready to do it sometimes. And, and if you give that time, that helps create a much better sense of safety rather than anxiousness about, oh my God, I have to do something. I'll just do something, right? Yeah. Like sometimes wild actions might be because if I, I'm supposed to do something, I'll just do something rather than I'll just wait and figure out what it is I actually need to do. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's great. That you do that. It took it took me a while to like make that a big practice and make it consistent and and that works for you. It works. It works really well. Yeah, and then the the kid also feels heard sometimes. You know, like I said, like you get to see their experience and you get to see what they do with it. And one of the best books I've ever read is the reason I jump, and in it, it's written by I think the boy was fourteen at the time, but he was nonverbal, and he's like, "Would you stop giving me the answers? I have the answers. You just need to give me time to spit them out." Beautiful. Do you know what I mean? He's like, give me time to process what you said. I have the answer. Let me find it in my file boxes in my brain. Perfect. To come back. And I was like, oh, right. Give them time. Yeah. Yeah. So key, right? And that really creates a much bigger space for safety to be present. So we can read each other's cues. You have time to sort of be present which is part of this too, like being able to just be present, be here, and notice what's right here in the room, right here, right now. So another way to help calm, if, if like minds are going, you know, if your ideas or the kid is all over the place, it's sort of like, just notice, what color is the table, you know, right here? Is it warm or is it cool to your hands when you touch it? Does it have sharp edges or round corners? You know, like, um, or pick something you see and tell me what color it is. And how do your eyes move as you look at it? Does your head move when you look at it? Um, or um, can you feel your butt on the chair? Your sitting bones. Can you feel your sitting bones? And can you feel the chair meeting your sitting bones? Two different questions, right? Right. But it's sort of connecting their sensory stuff on the inside with the environment on the outside. 
So we're trying to connect those two things in the room right here, because then it kind of brings everything into just what's physically here. Can I manage what's here? Can I see it? Can I sense it? Can I manage it here? And this is great for adults as well. This is really good. If I'm in the dentist chair, and I'm not happy in the dentist chair, I, I watch those ceiling tiles, I tell you. I know everything that's going on on the ceilings in dentist's office. And because I can see the cracks and the lighting fixtures and what shape the lighting fixtures and all those things. That's how I manage me in an environment where I'm a little nervous. So the dentist needs to project something interesting on the ceiling. Some of them do. I, I have seen such things in some of the kids, especially in my, my therapy oriented or like kid friendly ones. They have like little movies that play on the ceiling. I'm like, you're so brilliant. Wish my or even posters, you know, posters of Hawaii or the ocean yeah. or something. It's like, oh yeah, this is great. <laughs> Right. This is, I'll just manifest where I'm going right now Yeah. as I sit here in the dentist chair. But sort of really helping myself notice that stuff so that I, I can just sort of notice what's happening in the moment. Am I okay with what's here right now? Yeah. And then playing with the breath. Breath is interesting because our exhale, when we breathe out, we're tapping into the parasympathetic nervous system. And when I inhale, I'm tapping into the sympathetic nervous system. So if I need to liven myself up, like after I was coming out of surgery, you know, the day after surgery, I was realizing I'm still really sluggish. Mm -hmm. I need to actually get myself out of the sort of free state I seem to still be in, into a more vitalized state. So I really started to play with my in-breath and sort of feeling the vitality that the in-breath gave me. If I want to calm myself, like before going out to, to um, do a talk, or when I'm working with a really excitable horse, right? I'll do a long, slow out breath. And that in itself just brings in the parasympathetic into the room. The others notice it. You know, other bodies around you notice these things and start to ping off of that. Our nervous systems notice what the other nervous systems are doing. And that can start to calm another person that can calm me. Um, and you can play with it, you know, you can play with, if I breathe out, can I keep breathing out until I feel I'm done and then wait for my body to tell me when it's time to breathe in? So it becomes interesting, you can try it out, right? Like, mm. when you breathe out, keep breathing out. And then just wait. Until your body says, now's a nice time to breathe in. <laughs> I'm going to play with that one. Right, because a lot of us breathe sort of, we have a range about this big that we breathe in. Right. Right, but if I breathe out more, if I have trouble sleeping, for example, I might focus on my out breath. I'd follow the out breath out and wait. And it's not until you're turning blue in the face, you're just waiting for your body to say, now's a nice time to breathe in. <laughs> Yeah, please do not wait till you're blue in the face. <laughs> no, 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 you don't want to do that, right? But you're kind of just waiting for, your body will tell you, it's got built-in sensors in you saying, now's a good time. Yep. Uh, another one, you can breathe out and imagine settling onto your bones. So you, there's a, a way of breathing out where you sort of collapse into dejection. And there's another breathing, way of breathing out where you settle into support. So it's like you're feeling like you land in your bones. Yeah. And you can sort of sense, what's it like to land in your bones when you breathe out? And if you have someone that collapses, you can ask them, is it different? Because this sort of takes you into the two sides of the bridge. Landing yeah. in your bones, lets you land in a place where you're still available and maybe the world's more interesting here. Landing in collapse might have a whole different feeling to it. And so you can find out which one feels more familiar, which one feels more interesting, which one, you know, just knowing that people have a tool and they can sort of decide how do I want to land when I breathe out is interesting. All right, so it's, it's something you can play with. And the long, slow breath out, if you have trouble breathing out for a long time, just keep talking like I am right now for a much longer sentence and see what happens. Right, or sing. If you sing, sing a long phrase and can you maintain it? That will bring in the parasympathetic nervous system. Stephen Porges talks about that a lot too, you know, as ways to sort of help it. And then the safe feeling connection or relationship. This is, all these things above here, all feed into things we can do to help build safe feeling relationships. And as mammals, we have all sorts of safety requirements and safety cues that we, that we look for because 
we're born and we're helpless and we need um, those around us to help us learn how to feel safe. This was the thing. Um, the ventral vagus nerve, this, this nerve in here that works with social engagement, um, you have to learn how to use this. The dorsal vagus nerve, the one that does the deep freeze, you know, where you just, you go into a big shutdown if things are really bad, that's something we're born with. And it functions when we're born as sort of the ultimate shutdown valve. You know, it's sort of, but it's fairly sort of, sort of a blunt instrument. It sort of deals with things. It's not how you best manage your states, right? It's a bit good if you can manage your states from here where you have some nuance and there's, you know, oh, now I'm feeling a little better. I don't have to be so worried about this. You know, there's the example of uh, my horse and I going out for a walk and, and there's these little white, little birds that in winter turn white. They're like grouse, but they turn, they're ptarmigan and they burrow in the snow. And uh, my horse and I are walking down the trail together, you know, I'm just taking her out for a walk. And one of these little guys bursts out of the snow right in front of us, because it's what they do. They hide in the snow until danger is right there, and then they jump out and they fly away. Well, my horse and I both go, wah, and kind of jump towards each other, right? And then we're in there, and we're kind of going, ah. But then the thinking brain's got going, and we look at each other, and it's like, it was a fluffy little bird. I think we're okay. What do you think, right? Yeah. And so we just think of, okay, so now we can down regulate this so that we don't have to be in this big response. I can come out of this differently, right? Whereas, yeah. you know, if she was in the wild, she might have galloped off and then come to the thinking state. Right. Okay, time begins way back there. I'm good now, right? <laughs> so it's just sort of um, learning how to be able to come into this place of, of feeling safer is something that is learned. And we ping off the others around us. So we really, our bodies are always checking what's going on around us. Who's safe? Who feels safe to be around? Yeah. Um, and we're looking for the safe feeling connection. And it's the one that feels safe, not the one where I think it should be safe. And so there's lots of things we can do um, through play, through engagement, through how we interact, through how we talk, all those things, where we help them figure out what's safe, what isn't, what are the cues. And um, the kinds of cues that we can give are, you know, examples like giving variety and tone in the voice. Right. right? If I talked in a really flat voice like this, it would be very different to talk to me and so on than it would be, a, you know, when I'm, when I'm giving a presentation with more liveliness. Right. Also, if I sit there and start, you know, if I'm talking to you and going, yeah, I'm really interested in doing this talk, but oh, look, yeah, I'm really interested. It's great. I'm really glad to be here, right? That kind of thing. And so, like that also. Biologically, you're probably going, she's not paying attention to me. And again, we can notice it in our animals, my cat. You know, my cat comes over and wants two minutes of quality time with me. So she comes over and he sits there, right? And he sits there and he waits, and then a little paw comes out and he touches me. And it's like, if I'm busy on my computer or doing something else, he just sits there and he waits and he touches me again. And it's like, hi, how are you doing? You know, and so like, no, that's not it. Touches me again, right? And he waits until I turn and I stroke his ears and I tell him how handsome he is. And it's like, yes, would you like a little, you know, scratch on the ears, under the chin, all that stuff. And then he's good. Then he goes up. Right? Yeah. But there's that quality of the connection that matters. And noticing, you were talking about this, noticing the experience of the, the person you're with. So if they are indicating that they're starting to ramp up, can you catch that? Can you see that? And then go, hey. What can we do? You know, it's, it's, you know, let's, let's do something here and let's, let's make it a little easier or whatever. And just being present with them in that way. And if a person is learning this and they find it difficult to do with a person, with adults I work with, I often tell them, go practice with, you know, a dog or a cat or a horse or somebody because doing it with humans can be really hard. Yeah. Humans are, you know, it's much more complicated, those relationships. But animals, they let you know if something's good, they let you know if something's not good. And you can just sort of read it from them and you can kind of go, oh, I get it. On a biological level, I get what they're telling me. And that, that makes sense to me. And we can learn a lot from watching the animals and going, ah. Oh, yeah, that's, for sure. That's what feels good, that's what doesn't. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and some part of this comes into like that co-regulating place, knowing that I'm a safe person, that I would never ask them to do something that's not safe once we've built that rapport. 
And even some of my kids, they will come because they need that squeeze, that deep pressure. But really what's really calming them down is the fact that I am giving them a hug and they can feel my chest going up and down. And eventually they will, they will synchronize. Their breath will synchronize with mine. But if I can't keep myself calm, yeah. if my heart's going, they're never going to calm down. So yeah. They need to know that I know this is safe. I know that the, everything's under control and that, that this really isn't that scary. Because if I think it's scary, then it must really be scary. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, you know, we were talking earlier, you know, I, I can't mask it. It's the same with animals. If I come in, you know, if I, if I try to mask and I'm coming to a kid, you know, it's like, and I'm really worried. It's like, I'm perfectly calm. Yeah. You know it. Calm voice. And they're like, no way. Beans and baloney, right? So like that's or it's I just baloney. It's bugging you. <laughs> they, can, they can see it. They, it doesn't matter how you try to mask it and put the fun voice on and the big smile. Yeah. They're like, fake. Yeah. And we all know it. It's just that some of us, um, you know, we develop the social niceties to sort of pre pre pretend along. But yeah. when you get kids that are really looking for who's who's safe and who's reliable out there and are easily set off if you're not, yeah. they're going to respond, right? So it's it's one of those things that okay, learn how to do. So that's those are the places where I really bring myself here and now. I practice all these things myself. Breath oh, out sure. here and now. I feel my feet on the ground, ground under my feet. I look I look for their cues. I try to respond to what's in the room with them right now, and just sort of say. Let's deal with what's right here, right now. You know, like, like let's, let's just be yeah. together. For sure. Yeah. So that's, that's sort of the, the, the ideas for today. I mean, it's a few little ideas, and it's the opening of lots of options, but it's the place where we can start, and it's what we can do, right? And feeling safe really does open the door to everything else. It's the foundation. Mm -hmm. and, and ease and goodness in life. And we have the skills, we have the capacity to plant the seeds that can help cultivate this. We can help make this happen. It doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. It doesn't mean it's going to happen all the time. But it's ways to sort of start to open up the door for it more and more in what we do. And it's really... And see, being able to bring it back. It's an analogy. Feel it in yourself, right? Feel what your sense in your own self would do. What, and if you're not sure about your own self, you can imagine an animal. How would an animal respond to this if they had freedom to respond? You know, because you could sort of see it in them and go, oh, they'd feel good or they wouldn't like this or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. and just let that biology and your own, our own humanity guide us in this because it's this being human business is a big complex thing, right? And our whole oh. self is part of that and can really help inform us on what makes sense. Oh, for sure. So I just want to, I'm going to put on the screen for a couple of seconds each, these page, a couple of pages of resources. Um, fabulous people here. Uh, Irene Lyon is the one whose slides I've used a bit. It's got lots of online resources. Um, great stuff about working with people and animals from Linda Tellington Jones uh, on pain, one of the best pain talks I've ever heard. It's great. He's, he's awesome. very funny. And Dr. Stephen Porges, fabulous work, um, working with the polyvagal theory and with social engagement and connection. And um, these other, uh, Bessel van der Kolk is a doctor who's worked a lot with trauma. Gabor Maté was one of the first doctors to really talk about how does stress uh, affect us when it's swimming around on the inside for too long. So those are some books for us. Just leave a little bit here about me. That's me learning to surf. Talk about exciting stuff that goes between being scary and fun and scary and fun. Yeah. My big horse. I like to use the one that jumped with the charm again. Nice. And then me. So if anybody's got questions or wants to talk to me more, has emails or whatever, there's my email information. Awesome. And, and, and where do you operate out of? Because this might go over into Halifax and some friends over there. So let's cool. make sure they know that you're here. Yeah, so I, I'm on Vancouver Island, um, in Deep Bay on Vancouver Island. Moved down from the Yukon last year, so now I'm in the balmy south. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk with her. I can talk by Skype, whatever, you know, like Skype awesome. is great. It was so nice to, to have you here, and thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge. I am so grateful for everything you do and all the knowledge you brought to us today. And I hope that we can maybe do something again sometime. It'd be fun.
I'd love to. I would love to. And I, I'm so, you know, I just love that anybody is, you know, trying to figure out this being human business and working with other humans and working with our kids. You know, all of that is, is what keeps life interesting. Not always easy, but always interesting. <laughs> Fair enough. Not always easy. Yeah. But there is never a dull moment. 